very much, Anna, and uh, thank you to the British Council and to my colleagues in Pue. It's an absolute delight and pleasure to be here in Mexico with you. And I'm going to share some provocations about the whole issue of women and leadership in higher education. And when Helena and Anna invited me, they said, please don't come and be boring and bland and polite and British. Come and provoke us. Okay, well, let's start off by having a quick snapshot of where the women vice chancellors are and are not around the globe. And here you have some statistics. And you'll see that Norway, as with many of the Nordic countries, leads the way with over 30% of their, they call them rectors, the heads of universities are, are, are women. That sounds very good, that's very impressive. Let's all uh, applaud the, Scandi the Scandinavian countries. However, it's always important when you look at statistics to get behind them, to interrogate them, to ask some difficult questions. What is interesting about the Nordic countries is that they have had quite a bit of success in terms of women rectors, but still only have about 20% female professors. So women are succeeding in one area, but not another. Also, it's important to ask which institutions are these women heading up? And they often are the universities that do not award doctoral degrees, so they're lower status. But having said that, some of the Swedish top universities, like Uppsala, for example, uh, has a female uh, vice-chancellor. Now the UK, my country, we have had equity <laughs> legislation for gender since the 1970s. We have the most wonderful policy context. We have excellent statistics. But nothing seems to change. Uh, every year, the statistics are reported. Uh, with, you have the media full of how women are not represented in leadership positions. But nobody does anything, or very few people actually do anything to make the changes. We just report the statistics. And we have approximately 17% uh, vice chancellors are women in, in Britain. Now, Mexico, you'll notice that there is a question mark next to the figure uh, of 8%. Well, I have worn Helena and Anna out with my email saying, please can you tell me where I can get the statistics? I have used all my contacts in Mexico. We have looked through every, every pick data set. We couldn't find them. What's the, what's the story here? What's the issue here? Are you collecting statistics but not publishing them? I noticed you collect statistics on women students but not women staff. So we did a little head count of the universities and came up with approximately 8%. But I'm sure you'll tell me that's wrong. But I'd like us to really focus on this issue about statistics. Now, I am not saying that gender is a, a, just a demographic variable. Gender is not just a noun. It's not just about counting more women in to male-dominated spaces. As we know, gender is a verb. We do gender. But there is a major political issue about which statistics get collected and which don't, because they tend to reflect the areas that we consider important? And is it that gender is not considered an important topic in many universities and ministries around the globe? And uh, Anna said I had been working in South Asia, and it was the same there, in India, Pakistan, etc. Okay, now, moving on, Hong Kong, you'll see, has a large zero. <laughs> and yet, this is one of the areas one of the regions, it's not a country, it's a jurisdiction, it's a region, 
which has had some of the most success in the global league tables. So Hong Kong is racing up the league tables, but does not have one single head of university in its eight universities. So there's a question there that I'd like us to reflect on in relation to these uh, performance indicators of excellence. What is measured and what is not measured? And why is gender not an indicator in the global league tables? Japan is a very similar situation. There are only two women vice chancellors in Japan, uh, and, one of, and they are women-only universities. And Japan is another area that is rocketing, racing up the global league tables. So quality does not take into account equality. And this is a central argument of my topic today. And then the US, again, masses of equity legislation, huge amount of activism, huge amount of academic networking and momentum around gender. They still only manage 26%. So what is happening? And I know we have time later to discuss this, but I'd be really interested in your analysis. Why are there so few women leaders globally? Are women all really useless? Are we hopeless? Do we lack leadership qualities? Well, how do we get the world to see women as leaders? How do we make women intelligible as leaders? What is it that people don't see when they look at women? Why don't they see it? And is there something about the way in which leaders are selected, observed, uh, that, that make us unintelligible? What do current practices reveal and obscure? And why is it that when you do get women leaders, they create, they have such a shock impact? Still people look at them as if they shouldn't be there. Why is it that they uh, create such a, a strong impact, just being a female leader, having a female head of state is still something that people comment on. And this region has done extraordinarily well in terms of getting women heads of state. Um, it, it, just this morning, uh, Chile was on the news, Brazil was on the news, and it's very unusual uh, to have so many women leaders. And, and African sub Sub-Saharan Africa is another area where there are a lot of women leaders. But why is it still so unusual? So what do we mean by leadership potential? Now, it's often assumed that you either have it or you don't. It's like talent. Um, and that it has to be observed and spotted. That it's something that's separate. Uh, and that it's static and that the right kind of selection processes will help to identify it. So is it that people have leadership potential and it's just a question of observing it and identifying it? Or is it a little bit more complex than that? Is leadership potential contingent? Is it contextual? And is it co-produced? Now, I'm sure many of you here have been to interviews for jobs, different stages in your life. And there are times when you go and you just flourish and thrive, you can answer all the questions, people think you're marvelous. And other times you go, you can't think of a thing to say, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a negative feeling and you perform really badly. You're the same person. So why is it that in some contexts we thrive and flourish, and in others, we don't. And I'm asking this in relation to leadership. Is there something about the way in which leadership is selected, identified, recruited, that makes it quite hostile and very unpleasant for women? But having said that, I don't want to represent women as these universal victims, uh, just failing all the time. 
What I've noticed from most of my research is that there is a two-way gaze. The leaders look at women and say, no, thank you, we'd rather have a man. But women are looking at leadership very critically. How are women being seen? They're being seen as deficit men. But also, how are women viewing leadership? And I understand you had Judith Butler here recently, and she has that wonderful phrase about unlivable lives. And it seems that across the globe, many women are looking at leadership and thinking, no thank you. This represents leading an unlivable life. 24 seven uh, hours of duty, huge amount of pressure in the neoliberal global academy, masses of performativity, huge emphasis on finance, on trying to regulate people, get them to do what they don't want to do. No thank you, I'd rather stay closer to my research. So I'm saying it's working in two directions. The establishment is looking at women and rejecting them, but women are looking at leadership and also saying, oh, no thank you. So I think there's some questions here. When I've been talking about this in different parts of the world, people have said, what is it that women hear when they hear narratives of leadership? What narratives are circulating about women's capabilities? And it's interesting that in many locations, national locations, it's assumed that in order to be a leader, you have to be very ruthless, very aggressive, very detached, very single-minded, and it's feared that women won't, be, won't have those capabilities. But there's also, there are also narratives about leadership that circulate, that could be deterring women that leadership is seen as something that is basically quite an unpleasant task. And when I was talking about this in Ireland once, they said, is this part of the patriarchal conspiracy? Are these, like, these narratives circulating about how tough leadership is, how undoable leadership is, in order to keep women out? So we need to ask these questions. Okay, well, we know where women are not. Where are the women? Where are the women in higher education? And we've already heard today how women are uh, enrolling as students. And globally now, there are more women than men as undergraduates in higher education. But it varies hugely from region to region. So women are entering the academy as students, but they're not getting into leadership. Where are they? They tend to be assistants or adjunct roles. Um, they're there in the roles that deal with all the problems, with the clutter, with the admin, with the bureaucracy, with the people, with the conflict. Uh, they protect the, usually the senior men from all the clutter. Um, and then there's this lovely term, I think you've all heard the term glass ceiling. Well there's this term glass cliffs. Anything that's very problematic, an area of, uh, that might be ready for closure, an area where there are a lot of conflicts and difficulties, put a woman in to sort it out. And then there are these velvet ghettos, areas like uh, quality assurance. Now this is huge in Britain. Uh, we, I wrote in, back in 2003 that Britain has the most highly audited higher education system in the world. We are audited for teaching, for research, for employability. Now we're audited for research impact. We are constantly being bureaucratically investigated. And it tends to be the women who head up all of that. Anything where there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of bureaucracy, that's where you'll find the women. Anything to do with the community, people, people skills. And I don't know how many of you are interested in this as, a, as an area about women in leadership, but there's a vast literature that is very essentialized uh, about women in leadership. Uh, they say that, for example, that women have better interpersonal skills, better communication skills. It's important to appoint more women because they're better working with people, better uh, team players. Well, I'm very, very 
uh, critical of that type of literature because I think it's very essentialized. But still, you tend to find women in areas where they have to have a lot of people contact. And of course, human resource management. So there are these ghettos. Where are the women not present? Well, as soon as you look at anything to do with research, you'll see there are very few women in senior positions. And research, as many of you know, is a pathway to leadership in universities. You often have to have a very successful research career in order to lead a university. And we have a, a massively uh, competitive global prestige economy now. Women are unlikely to be journal editors. Um, and what is interesting, I uh, hear questions asked all around the world, is how do people become journal editors? Is this open and transparent? Is the recruitment and selection open to all? Or is it people just tapping their friends on the shoulder and saying, there's a vacancy, would you like to take this over? <laughs> How do people get onto editorial boards? The same. Friends invite other friends. Now, why is this important? It's important because it's a major gatekeeping activity. It controls the creation, the production, and the dissemination of knowledge. And people like Malcolm Tite in Britain has done a, a count of who gets published and who gets cited. So it's not just the editors, but it's who actually gets to publish in the journals. And they are traditionally male-dominated, and it's men citing other men writers. So women are getting excluded from a vital part of the knowledge economy. The European Union is very good at statistics on gender. Um, I'm not saying they have changed things, but they keep good statistics. And there has been a big concern in Europe about who gets to lead research. And women are still hugely underrepresented, even in gender programs of research. They are underrepresented as research leaders, principal investigators. They tend to be more research assistants working on projects for male research leaders. Now, funding, research funding, is becoming increasingly difficult to get with austerity cultures around the world. So the decision making about who gets research money is very important. And there again, you'll see uh, women are absent on research boards. Uh, you'll see some research uh, funding councils that have no women on them at all. Um, women also rarely get awarded large grants. They very rarely apply for large grants. It's often felt that it's a complete waste of time applying for large grants because you're not going to get them anyway. So women tend to go for smaller, much smaller grants. Um, then the, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Nobel Museum, Nobel Prize Museum in Stockholm in Sweden. It's extremely interesting. Uh, it's so difficult to find any Nobel Prize winners who are women, apart from people like Marie Curie or Doris Lessing. But the majority of this museum uh, is filled with men, male prize winners. So there's an issue then about re misrecognition of women's capital. Women are doing research, women are writing, but it's not getting rewarded and recognized, particularly for prizes. They're also less likely to be conference keynote speakers, so thank you very much for inviting me here today. That, that's thrown the statistics. Um, I have a policy, uh, whenever I'm invited to attend a conference, if it's an all-male uh, speaker, panels of uh, speakers, I write back and I say, thank you for the invitation, but I won't be attending because it's all men speaking. And then that often backfires because they say, oh, could you come and speak? Often at last, uh, very short notice. But it is quite common to have all-male panels in academic circles. And there's even, I believe, a website now 
where <laughs> and, uh, you, you're not, some of you are nodding, you know it, where you're invited to write in and say, congratulations, you have yet another all-male panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so women are absent from where there is power. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read Dale Spender, her work back in the 70s made a very interesting comment. She made a very uh, insightful observation when she said, where, the, where women are, the power is not. So anywhere that controls power and influence, you'll see an absence of women. So women are likely to be seen as unreliable knowers. Now this is a very old debate, quite a tired debate, that somehow women are incapable of rational thought. And that was the argument that was used for centuries to keep women out of universities, uh, to keep women from having a vote. And we were talking about this yesterday. There's a, a, a new film out called Suffragette. Um, that talks about the, the suffragette movement in Britain. And at the end of the film, they have a whole list of when women in different countries achieved the vote. And in some countries, Saudi Arabia, women still do not have the vote. And in places like Kuwait, it was in 2006. In Switzerland, in Europe, it was in the 1970s. And one of the arguments that has been traditionally used to stop women having civil rights, civil liberties, is that women are incapable of irrational thought. That we're too emotional, we're too guided by our bodies, uh, we can't think sensibly. And there are still people saying that now. Larry Summers, the director of Harvard, uh, back in 2005, said women are incapable of doing science and technology work. And then he was sacked from Harvard, but he went on to advise Barack Obama. So it didn't, didn't damage his career, those, those, uh, those horrible views. So there's still this view, there's still this belief that women are unreliable knowers. We're not, we, we are not trustworthy as researchers. Um, and that we tend to, women tend to be tasked in the global academy with inward facing responsibilities looking after students, running courses, uh, looking after all the programs, etc., the pedagogy. And the research and the outward facing, the international work, tends to go to more men. So research resources and opportunities then are hugely competitively structured. And there are winners and losers. And this tends to reproduce and replicate uh, gendered hierarchies. So the, pe the people who win in wider society are those who also win in the research economy. Now, why does any of this matter? We were talking yesterday about some of the debates in gender studies, and there's a very strong trend in Britain, and I understand also in Mexico, to challenge gender binaries and say, we don't want to talk about men and women anymore. We're much more into fluidity. Uh, we, we, we're in a post-binary post world. Yes, that's true. And that's a, that's a dream for many of us. And at the, but at the moment, it's it, important to recognize that there's a huge unevenness. We are out of balance here. Why does it matter? Why does it matter if women aren't leading? Well, I would suggest that we need to think about this in at least two different ways. Often there's some very uh, lazy thinking about women in leadership. And there's just this assumption that if you count more women in, you will change the organization. That suddenly everything becomes more gender sensitive, women are promoted, women are supported, etc. This is a very, very essentialized view of gender. And I'm somebody who grew up under Margaret Thatcher as our Prime Minister. Uh, she did nothing for women. In fact, she, her policies worked against women in Britain. So just to say that if you change the body, you change the services, is, is, is rather reductive in its thinking. 
So I always suggest that when we're looking at this, we try and divide up the debates into employment and service. So um, counting more women in is important because the absence of women means you have a democratic deficit. Uh, the lack of women in decision-making roles is very important. There's also the issue of distributive justice. Uh, there's a global concern about the gender pay gap, for example. Um, it's around between 17 and 20 percent, even in countries like Sweden and Australia that have had a lot of uh, femocracy, state feminism, there is still a major gender pay gap. Vice chancellors earn a lot of money. They, they, they say that they deserve it because they have such uh, high pressure jobs, but they earn a lot of money. Three, four, five hundred thousand pounds is quite standard in Britain uh, per annum. So, Women are excluded from these, uh, these opportunities. And there's also a kind of structural prejudice that gets built into the institution. You think of all the professions that pass through the academy. We train lawyers, doctors, teachers, social workers. What do they see? What's the message that they get about women leadership? when in their university they don't see any women in authority. <laughs> then there are depressed career opportunities, that, that old cliche of the glass ceiling, that women can only get so far and no further. But one thing that I will keep coming back to, and that's this notion of misrecognition. What is it that women have to do to be seen differently? Why are women not recognized? And there's a very um, big concept about wasted talent now. And you'll see in, in a lot of the work that comes out from the international organizations, like the World Bank, for example, they talk about the gender deficit in human resource terms. This is wasted talent. It's smart economics to uh, upskill women because then you have a bigger pool of human resources. So okay, there are all the employment conditions, but then the services are very important as well. We get knowledge distortions. There's a whole new concept about epistemic injustice. Who is creating knowledge in the knowledge society? Who is the knowledge about? Are we still working with this enlightenment notion of the universal subject? And colleagues of mine in the European Union have, people like Theresa Rees, has explored, for example, how in medical research, they often test drugs just on men. So we don't know how they work on women's bodies. So that we still work with this notion of the universal subject, and we're getting distortions in knowledge. We get the reproduction of institutional norms and practices. But most importantly, we tend to construct women as other. The norm is the male manager. We think manager, we think male. And anything that's different is other. And that represents a huge burden. OK, now I promised you to be provocative, and let's have some provocations. Well, we have all this discourse about the global knowledge economy how knowledge is power, how we've moved away uh, from manufacturing. It's all about knowledge as service, as the good that's sold on the stock market, that's worth billions internationally. How is it that gender has escaped the logic of the Global Policy Academy? Now, we would not think of having an archaic IT system in, 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 in universities, but we do have archaic gender regimes. Why is that the case? We talk all the time about the importance of making sure everybody develops their potential, their capabilities, their capacities in the knowledge economy. Why is it that women's potential is being so reduced and women's capital is not being recognized? And then there's another area that I keep coming across in my research, and that cultural scripts for leaders, they tend to coalesce um, with normative gender performances. 
So this, what we admire in masculinities is what we admire in leadership. Ruthless, detached, disconnected, able to take authority. And it's still seen that women lack these dispositions. And then a huge area that's come up everywhere I've undertaken research is how are leaders selected? And does the process itself lack transparency? Does it reproduce privilege? So yes, a few women are being allowed in, but they tend to be from the most privileged backgrounds. And this is lack of accountability. Now, I don't know about Mexico, but in Britain we have a big industry of executive search agencies. They're called headhunters. And I was doing a lecture in Borneo once, and I used the term headhunters, and it created absolute confusion. Because as you know, headhunters in Borneo go back a long way. But there are these organizations called headhunters, or search agencies. So whenever there's a, a, a senior position, the universities engage these agencies at a huge cost. It's, it's a year's salary, a lot of money. And what do they do? They phone people up and they have informal conversations. They tend to phone up men. They are not gender sensitive. They ignore the equality legislation. They do a lot of relaying of prejudices verbally so there's no audit trail. They ring people up, they say, who do you think should be the next vice chancellor or rector? And people give a little list of all their friends and their network. So then they're invited to interview. And increasingly we are asking the search agencies to ensure that there are women on the short lists. And I'm often on these panels and you hear the search agents and they report about their short list and they say things like, well, you know, she's got two children. And I, and I listen to this and I say, excuse me, but I don't remember you mentioning that about any of the male candidates, about their family situations. Now, this is illegal in Britain, but because it's all done verb verbally and informally, they get away with it. So there is something very, very crucial about selection processes and accountability. And in many countries, the selection is political. The, the, the head of state appoints the vice chancellors. So you have to be politically aligned with the dominant party. And if there's a change of power, there's a change of vice chancellor. So it's all very precarious. And in South Asia, there was a lot of concern about this, that uh, it was more appropriate for men to network politically than for women. It was seen as quite uh, improper for women to push themselves forward into networks uh, for political gains. Okay, so I would just like at this stage to, to be absolutely clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that diversity is just about counting more women in, or more minorities in, or more people with disabilities in, etc. It's not about quantitative change. That is important, but that's not the end product. So there are these norm-saturated policy narratives which suggest all you have to do is take the underrepresented groups, put them in the system, and everything will be wonderful. Um, and that this is a form of smart economics, as the World Bank talks very much about gender equality in economic terms. Not social justice, not human rights, but in economic terms. It makes economic sense to educate more women and promote more women because it's a talent pool. So it's also assumed, as I said earlier, that if you change the body, you will change the product, the service. Count more women in, you have a lovely, gender sensitive, caring community. Well, we know that's not the case. Women can be as neoliberal as, as men. Um, so, gender is often in all of these debates counted simply as a demographic variable. There's very little exploration of the type that you do here in PWEG 
about gender as a verb, how gender gets relayed in everyday transactions. And some of my very early research was on micropolitics and how gender gets relayed through everyday transactions, conversations, exclusions, coalitions, networks. So it's not just about numbers, it's how gender operates on a daily basis. And what I'm suggesting is that, yes, we need the statistics, they are important, but they are not the whole story. And what we need is a sociology of absences. So let's inquire why there are these absences. Not just berate them, not just report them, but let's interrogate them. Why are there absences? Okay, well, I've been, thanks to the fantastic British Council, I've been collecting data around the globe. Um, and we've looked at literature, the literature review, and it's interesting how uneven the literature is uh, around the globe. There's a lot of it from uh, countries in high-income high countries, but often they're small-scale inquiries, they're PhD theses, they're master's theses. There's not a lot of investment in research in this area. We've conducted interviews in um, six uh, South Asian countries. Um, I worked in Malaysia as a visiting professor, um, did questionnaires, focus groups. The uh, British Council organized questionnaires in um, East Asia and uh, the Middle East and North African region. And we asked sort of questions about what makes leadership attractive or unattractive to women? What enables and supports women to enter leadership? And people's personal experiences of either being enabled or impeded. Okay, well, there were there was a lot, there were a lot of stories, a lot of narratives uh, we collected. And the areas that people seem to talk about the most uh, were recruitment and selection, as I said, latch transparency. But there was another area that was very, very interesting, and that many women had entered universities because of their passionate attachment to their discipline, to their research, to their subject areas. And I remember talking to women in Nepal, in, in South Asia, and they said they have had to struggle so hard to get an education. They had to leave their homes, leave their families, go abroad. They had, had spent decades getting their education. They didn't want to leave it and get into administration. And also it's assumed that if you are academically uh, able, you can just step into management, leadership, administration with no training, with no development. You can just do it. And that's often very problematic. And many of the women uh, I've interviewed around the world say, no, they are intellectuals. They are not managers. And then authority. Well, we've been using Sarah Ahmed's work in the UK, her work on the effective economy, and she talks about how certain uh, dispositions, certain emotions, are attributed to certain bodies. And authority does not stick to women. And the women we spoke to in different countries said that it was a constant struggle to claim authority. People just assumed they didn't know what they were doing, they were second-class citizens, they had to keep proving themselves, that nobody believed they had a right to be there. And authority is one of those dispositions that does not stick to women's bodies. Women have to constantly struggle to earn it. And then there's a, the big area of gendered divisions of labour. And although we live in a post, or we would like to live in a post-binary world, it seems as if we have binary divisions when it comes to labour. Women still uh, get responsibilised with masses of domestic work inside and outside organisations. And even in countries where women had servants, drivers, <laughs> gardeners, nannies, they still said they were responsible for making sure it all worked. 
And then you had this sexual spillover. So when women in organization went into women organize, into organizations, they were still responsible with all the domestic uh, issues. And what, what's important about that, that even the women who were single and child-free and completely dedicated to their careers, it was still assumed by male panels that they would at some point turn, give it all up and, and turn to families. So there's this assumption that women will always have this split focus, that women aren't serious professionals that we'll do it for a little bit of time, but then we'll, we'll wander back into the home, the domestic domain, even if women demonstrate that that's not the case. Another big area was about networks, the network society. We're told we live in a network society. Everything nowadays is about who you know rather than what you know. Uh, connections, coalitions, partnerships, and particularly in the context of globalization. There is a dominant discourse of the global partnership, how important it is for universities, for individuals, for groups, for societies to be linked, partnered internationally. Who gets the opportunity to get into these networks and who doesn't? And so many women talked about that in terms of how they are very male dominated. The men invite each other to, to speak, to write, to become visiting professors, etc. And there's this huge strand about what is gender appropriate. So it's okay for men to let's have lunch together sometime, talk about this research center or this bid. But if a woman were to say to a senior man, let's have lunch together, has a slightly different connotation. And society polices the boundaries of what is gender appropriate. <laughs> and we had a lot of data about women being pushy, uh, being too ambitious. So if women exhibited the sort of traits that a lot of their male colleagues did, they were chastised. And then one of the biggest areas was about the hostile organizational cultures. Um, women talked about it being quite toxic, quite nasty, very stressful, a lot of undermining. Sometimes it was done overtly. People say, I don't believe women should be leaders. But often it was done in a very covert, subtle way. So that the, you could never be entirely sure what was going on. But women felt it. They felt undermined. They felt, for example, uh, we had women telling us about how administrative staff would never do anything that they asked them to do. Or they did it and they did it badly. They did it late. They just didn't respect them as leaders. But it was in that area that's very subtle and nuanced and difficult to prove. OK. Now, we asked women what attracted them to leadership. And when I was analyzing this data, I noticed there was, they, they hardly wrote anything, or they hardly said anything about this. They said a few things like, oh, power, or uh, influence. I can, I can make the changes I want to see. Or I can, I, can, I can use my values. I can implement my values. Uh, you know, I can, I can uh, apply my feminism to a whole organization get them to really think and change. Some talked about financial rewards. You know, I've worked really hard. Now's the time for a bit of payback. Recognition, at last, people see what I'm worth. They see my value. But there wasn't, a, there wasn't much energy in this. There wasn't a lot of fire and fight. It, it felt kind of lukewarm, this whole area. When I came to looking at why is senior leadership unattractive to women, I got pages and pages of data. And there was such an emotional charge to this, this work. Well, this is about neoliberalism, and I think neoliberalism was one of the biggest deterrents. And women tended not to name it. They didn't say, oh, I don't like the neoliberal global academy. They didn't talk in that way. But they talked about the aspects of neoliberalism that just put them off. So, Finance, financialization, the fact that everything now 
is reduced to income and profit, and particularly the, you know, the pri in the private sector. Uh, nobody ever asks you now what your research project is about intellectually. They ask you, how much is it for? How, how big is it? It's all about size. Um, they talk about this, uh, the accountability and the league tables, and that everything is in the public domain. Everything that you do is out there. Uh, you're under constant pressure to compete regionally, nationally, globally. And the, the universities, that, the winners, those at the top of the global league table, just get more and more rewards. So there's a kind of concentrate, research concentration. If you get a lot of research, you'll get more research. And this is the, all of this is putting women off. And they also found that the neoliberalism as my colleague in Britain, Stephen Ball, would argue, it's about minds as well as money. It's about making people internalize the, the, the aims of neoliberalism and really struggle and compete to achieve them. So it's about making individuals want what the neoliberal global academy says they should want, to be competitive. Lots of publications, lots of research money. So all of this, Women just saw leadership as mediating and reproducing neoliberal values. And there was very little opportunity to do things differently. Leadership was a neoliberal script. It was about complying and conforming to these dominant uh, values that, 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 that move across national boundaries. Another area was about being other, always being in the minority being the only woman in a senior team, always having to carry the load, the effective load of people's prejudices, the discriminatory practices, of the fact that they didn't actually respect you because you were different. And then as I was saying, the signifier woman reduces the, the authority of the signifier leader. Um, and it's, you know, when I, I remember, but my mother used to talk about lady doctors. She said, I went to my doctor today, it's a nice lady doctor. And I used to say, why can't you just say doctor? <laughs> why, why, why do you need to say lady doctor? And there is still that mentality of a woman leader. Not quite the same, is it? Not quite the same. Um, and then in many cultures, we hear about it's uh, absolutely standard for women should, should walk behind men or walk behind uh, senior members of the hierarchy. And there's a kind of symbolic order. I think very few women, very few feminists would ever think that it was appropriate to always be behind men. But we do, in a way, think of that in terms of qualifications, of leadership, it's still seen as inappropriate for women to lead men, to give orders to men. Uh, my colleagues in China and Hong Kong are looking into this whole concept of the third sex. I don't know if any of you have heard of this. It's a very interesting concept. Women with PhDs, the higher educated women in China and Hong Kong, are seen as the third sex. They're not properly female because they have surpassed men. They're becoming unmarriageable, as if that is the, as if that is the goal of every woman. Um, they're also seen; they're often seen as leftover women. They're too educated; they won't get husbands. So there is still this view that the symbolic order is that women should be behind; they shouldn't lead. And then this. A key aspect of neoliberalism, I'm going to be talking about it in more detail on Friday night, is financialization. Everything now is about money, profit, and competition. And a lot of women were saying they couldn't cope with that. And because um, leaders have so much power, they also felt that they were wide open to allegations of corruption. And they said that uh, often it was assumed if women did get into powerful positions, she was there because of corruption, often sexual corruption, or family uh, networks, or nepotism, etc. And then there's this notion that neoliberalism writes a script for you. 
these are the policies, these are the key performance indicators, this is what you have to do. Uh, we can't think about gender, we can't think about diversity, because these aren't indicators. Yeah, we, these are luxury products. We have to focus on the dominant performance indicators, and that is the script. So there's a, a, a very strong view that there is very little room to manoeuvre, very little opportunity to really make your mark and do things differently, because the neoliberal uh, agenda is one about conforming and compliance. <laughs> And then a big question, you know, who determines the field? And do women lack the capital, the economic, the political, the social and symbolic capital to redefine the requirements of the field? We are newcomers. We are latecomers. You know, we can't come, we're guests. We don't have, we don't have uh, a sense of entitlement to be there. We've been allowed in to the academy very, very, very late. Uh, the, in, in Britain, the first university to allow women in was the University of College London, which allowed women in in, eight, eight, in the, eight, the, the end of the 19th century. So we have a very short history of being allowed into the academy. So we have to come in on the terms of the hosts. We can't come in and start disrupting it. So the neoliberal uh, leadership is increasingly seen as just reproducing and installing the neoliberal gains. And it's a relationship of entanglement. Knowledge is a commodity now. It's sold on the stock market. Uh, we were talking earlier about all the branch campuses that exist around the world. That is, Britain's, uh, universities in Britain open campuses in Dubai in Qatar, in Malaysia, in China, etc. It's a huge industry. Market values are what counts. You know, what sells now in higher education? And we were talking earlier with your um, wonderful Dean of Humanities about the, how endangered the humanities are because they don't make money. Uh, and everything now is going into the science, the STEM subjects, because they do make money. Um, Audit, performance management, quality assurance, constantly auditing, checking, are we doing things right? Putting private in-house matters into the public domain. And then of course the global prestige economy. The winners in this economy get more and the losers get less. And in this uh, a whole new area now in Britain that's been uh, introduced and Britain has this horrible uh, habit of exporting its higher education policies around the world and we have a lot of tr policy transfer. So what's happening in Britain today will be happening here very soon, I can promise you. And we have a big impact agenda. So no, it's no longer a question of producing marvellous intellectual res uh, research. We have to demonstrate that our research has had impact on the economy, on society, on professions, on policy, that, that we have actually changed things through our research. And we have to produce evidence and audit and a trail of this. So research has to be useful, it has to be mobilised, it has to be transferred from the university into society. And that is measured and audited. So we are constantly being held to account in the neoliberal economy. And this produces an enormously powerful, effective economy. Uh, women have to do a lot of identity work when they are leaders. They have to work with resistance, recalcitrance, truculence, or a lovely phrase by a writer, uh, Xian Engai, ugly feelings. And ugly feelings aren't the big, operatic, life or death. They're the everyday, the jealousies, the resentments, the nastiness, the spitefulness. Women related so much about this, what they had to deal with, and how it wore them out. And then, within the neoliberal academy, you have to colonise uh, your colleagues' subjectivities, their desires, their aspirations. You've got to get them all to want what the neoliberal academy says they should want. So everybody has to be competitive. 
Everybody has to want to be up there in the global lead tables. Everybody has to want to get big research grants, etc. So it's about often making people do what they don't want to do. And then there's all the, the, your, the internalized stuff, self-doubt. If people keep telling you you're not a real leader, at some point you begin to believe it. And there's a lot of self-doubt, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress. Um, and occupational stress is now the biggest cause of absenteeism in higher education in Britain. Uh, the pressures are enormous. Um, and how uh, neoliberalism works on the self. It works, it, it's about internalizing the goals, the desires, etc. So it's very easy to make people feel inadequate, they're losers, they're useless, they're hopeless if they don't meet these goals. So all of this tends to restrict rather than build capacity and creativity. And quite understandably, women are saying, no thank you. So there's rejection. And studies are showing how women are rejected. There's a, been a big study by Simonetta Manfredi which showed that even when men and women go through the same leadership development programs, the men go on and get the senior jobs, the women don't. Even when they're going for interviews, they're getting right to the last point of the selection, they don't get the jobs. Then there's a lot of refusal. Women are saying, no, this is not what I did. I entered the academy to be an intellectual, not to be a manager. And then often women, when they do enter, they're quite reluctant. They have to be pushed and pressured and coerced and pleaded with. Please, will you take this job on? It's really important that we get some more women, etc. They, they enter very reluctantly. So there, it, it's difficult to know why we have this absence. And I want to hear your views later, why you think this is the case. But there are a whole range of barriers, and the power of the socio-cultural is enormous. What is seen as gender appropriate? What is it okay for women to do? Um, social class and caste. Now, I know that intersectionality is a very big concept here in Puerg, as, as it is in Britain. You can't just look at gender in isolation. You have to intersect it with other structures of inequality. But there's also masses of uh, lack of investment in women. Women are not trained to be leaders. They're not sent on these expensive, high-profile development programs, etc. Organisational cultures are often very male-dominated and very unfriendly and hostile to women. Perceptions of leadership are often very gendered, recruitment and selection, and then family is often seen as a barrier. Uh, family responsibilities. Uh, we had a lot of data in South Asia about mothers-in-law saying, you can't go off to those international conferences. You've got children to look after. And they were kind of policing the boundaries of what was seen as appropriate and inappropriate. And international work is often seen as very inappropriate for mothers. And then this whole area of gender authority and corruption. And then the enablers, policies. Now, I know that Anna is very interested in gender mainstreaming. Uh, affirmative action, I mean, quotas having special, you know, having, ensuring there are women on short lists, etc. And some of the policies on life work balance, because a lot of the interventions that make things better for women actually make things better for everybody. So getting a healthier working environment so that you don't work 24-7 is really important for everybody. Women only provision there are courses like the Association of Commonwealth Universities. They run these programs for women, develop, women developing women managers around the Commonwealth. Um, mentoring. A lot of women said that they had never had any guidance, sponsorship. Nobody had helped them decode the system. They had to learn it all for themselves. Uh, professional development was seen as important. Sometimes family was an enabler. If you had a supportive family, particularly if you came from a socio-economically <laughs> privileged background, you had people who could guide you, who could help you. And then evidence. 
we need statistics. We need gender disaggregated data. And one area that is hugely influential in helping women's careers is internationalization. Uh, women often are ignored and misrecognized and overlooked in their own workplaces. But then they join international networks and it's different, they are seen differently. They have a different identity. And mobility and internationalization are very, very important to promote gender equity. So women then are, they're reflexively scanning. It's not just a question of being ignored. Um, but women are rarely identified or supported or encouraged and developed for leadership. They're rarely achieving the most senior positions. They tend to just get the assistant roles. Um, and when they do get the most senior roles, they're often in less elite institutions. But what's really important is personally and collectively, women are not desiring senior leadership. What's the story there? And they're not attracted to the labour intensity of the competitive, the audit cultures, and these neoliberalised, managerialised uh, universities. But they are constrained by socio-cultural messages. What is it appropriate to do? Women are entering middle management, assistant roles. But women often get put on career pathways that don't lead to the top. So lots and lots of teaching, or a lot of temporary contracts or part-time work. Women are very burdened with the affective load of being other, um, always having to navigate between personal and professional duties. And they often perceive leadership not as a fantastic career gain, but as some kind of loss. Loss of research identity, loss of work-life balance, loss of health, loss of well-being, loss of community. So women, but they are demanding change. So, as I said, it's not just about getting more women in to male-dominated environments. What are we asking women to lead? Women are being rejected, women are refusing, and they're self-excluded and often reluctant. But what do we mean by change? What is the change we want to see? And often in any kind of feminist circles, we, we're very good at critique. We say what's wrong. We say what we don't like. But we don't always say what we would like to see. And do we have shared understandings of what sort of view we have of the future? So it's not about counting more women in. It's about asking questions about leadership itself. Can leadership narratives and technologies, practices, can they be more than just repetitions and discursive performances? Can they be more than just scripts? How do we get, um, how do we move away from leadership being associated with the values and the norms of the neoliberal university? And I would suggest that we need for a revisioning of leadership itself, not just getting more women in to unhealthy practices, but eventually trying to make leadership so that it's more, more generous and ultimately gender-free. Thank you very much. <laughs>